Excellent. All right, keep your Bibles open there in Mark chapter 2, not 3, Mark chapter 2. And if you look at <laughs> verse number 20, Mark chapter 2 and verse number 20, it says, uh, But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. The title for the sermon tonight is Fast in Those Days. Fast. I wanted to preach about fasting today, and the reason I wanted to preach about this today is uh, I do want to have a church wide fast next Wednesday if we can. And so I wanted to go through this topic of fasting, you know, keeping ourselves from, from food and uh, subjecting our body a little bit from its desires. Uh, because as I've been saying to you on these Wednesdays, I want to be preaching sermons to you that uh, are going to help our church in light of, you know, myself and the family being away down in Sydney for those 12 months. And I do believe there's a lot of things that we need to be praying about, a lot of things. And we need to uh, take these things seriously. We want to go to the Lord and, and for the Lord to be aware and know that, hey, we're taking these things seriously. This is important. You know, we need some spiritual victory in these areas. And so many times when we preach about fasting, you know, it, it's, it's kind of common knowledge. We, we, it's not just fasting, but we pray and we fast, okay? And, and somehow through this process, there is a, a spiritual uh, uh, calling out to the Lord that we need Him to step in uh, more so than the average prayer. Okay, somehow this works at a supernatural level, and I'll explain to you a few reasons why I see this from the Bible. And so I do believe it's important that we do spend time in fast. Uh, and if you've never fasted before, you know it's something you should consider because I do believe this is one of those pillars of your Christian faith that you need to have in your life from time to time. You know, just like going to church is one of those pillars, just like reading your Bible is, you know, praying is one of your pillars, you know, you should consider fasting as something that you, can, you do, you know, on a, on a semi-regular basis, okay? Now, look, when it comes to me, I'm, I'm a little bit, as you guys, may, maybe some of you know, I've got a little bit of a mild lactose intolerance when it comes to my body. You know, things like carbs and sugars don't really go well with me. I get bloated, you know. Um, it looks like I've put on this weight very quickly, but it's just been bloated from all that. And sometimes, you know, especially like after, you know, we feasting, like when we usually feast during Christmas or birthdays, maybe there's a lot of food, I get a bit unsettled and, and uncomfortable in my body. And I generally just decide, look, I'm just going to fast the next day. Because, you know, just fasting kind of helps my body uh, work through, uh, you know, those sugars and those carbs or whatever. And I, I tend to just fast because I'm not feeling very well. But one of the advantages of being a believer is I'm like, well, if I'm going to fast, I might as well pray and fast, right? <laughs> There's probably a few things that I need to bring before the Lord anyway. And so I can mix these two things, right? Just for my personal health, but also the spiritual needs. That, you know, there's always something to be praying about. There's always something to be bringing before the Lord, you know? whether that's something personal or whether that's the church or, or just, just the work that God has left us to do. Maybe it's the concerns about the pandemic and, and the restrictions, you know, concerns about the vaccination being mandatory. Sorry, These are things that we should be bringing before the Lord because these are, these are serious things, right? And so we should be uh, thinking about how can we fast? How often should we fast? And so as I said, I do want to try to fast, have a church-wide fast next Wednesday. And so, you know, if, if you're normally someone that brings a bit of, uh, you know, um, food, you know, biscuits and things like that, please don't bring that because it'd be very tempting uh, to break the fast if you bring that. So, th you know, please don't bring any, any uh, biscuits or anything like that this coming Wednesday or next week, you know. But if you look at verse number 18, let's backtrack a little bit there. Mark chapter 2 verse 18. So should we fast, number one, you know, should we fast? We don't read about fasting all that much in the New Testament. Quite often, if you're looking up the topic of fasting, you're going to find more information in the Old Testament. And so sometimes people bring it up, you know, in the New Testament, should we fast? We'll look at verse number 18. It says, And the disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast, and they come and say unto him, Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but thy disciples fast not? So the disciples of Jesus were not fasting, right? They had Jesus in their midst. Looks like they were Baptists. They, were, they, they loved their food, right? Verse number 19. And Jesus said unto them, can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. Okay? And so, of course, Jesus Christ referring himself to the bridegroom. He's saying, look, the bridegroom's here. This is a time of rejoicing. This is a time of having, you know, God manifest on the flesh, walking the earth. It's not a time to fast. It's time to celebrate. It's time to enjoy the company of Christ in a bodily form. But the day's coming when he's going to be gone. And then his disciples will fast, he says. Okay? So, hey, that's, two, that's 2020. Jesus Christ is still gone. Okay? He hasn't returned as of yet. And so, what's the teaching here? The expectation is that Christ is expecting his disciples, his followers, his believers to fast from time to time, okay, as the need arises. 
So should we fast? Absolutely. Now please go to Psalm 35. You don't have to say in the book of Mark. Psalm 35, verse number 11. Psalm 35, verse 11. Psalm 35, verse 11. Because I want to show you the effects or maybe even the purpose of fasting. What does it mean? Hey, you know, it might seem a bit unusual, you know, going to without breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And, you know, the fast that I most often take is just a day fast. Where it's just, just you know, your, your, your regular three meals a day. I just go without that food. That's generally what I do, okay? But, yeah, you can, I guess you can fast one meal, okay? Uh, that, might, that can be difficult for some people, all right? But I, I think, you know, trying to fast an entire day, you know, is, is the one that you see in the Bible more often than most. But then you have other fasts where, you know, you see Jesus Christ fasted for some 40 days, you know, things like that. And, you know, but if you look at Psalm 35 verse 11, I just want you to understand what is the purpose of fasting. It says in verse number 11, false witnesses did rise up. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. They rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. So here we have the psalmist, uh, most probably David, speaking about the fact that he has these enemies, right? These people that hate him, right? He tries to do good to them, but they return evil to him. But look at this in verse number 13. Look how he deals with his enemies. In verse number 13, he says, But as for me, when they were sick, that's his enemies, my clothing was sackcloth, I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned into mine own bosom. Okay? So what is he saying? He's saying, look, even when my enemies are sick, uh, you know, he decides to pray and fast for his enemies, okay? And he says he does it to, uh, to humble his soul with fasting, right? And then it says that he prays. It's, it's coming, the prayers, you know, returning to his own bosom. You know, it's coming from him. He's praying, obviously, uh, you know, for others, but it's like the Lord is blessing him in return for the prayers that he's doing for others. And so you can see that uh, the, 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 uh, the psalmist here, even... Uh, fast for the, his, when he finds out that his enemies are sick. But I think the reason he does this is because, you know, if you have an enemy that's making your life difficult and all of a sudden you find out he's like dying from cancer or something, you know, the temptation is, yeah, let him die. He's my enemy. So he says, no, you know what? I'm going to humble myself. And the way I'm going to humble myself is by fasting. Okay? So what is one reason why we should fast when we, when we participate of prayer and fasting? is just to humble ourselves, okay? We live in a, in a flesh, in a body that has a big ego, brethren. You know, it's got a lot of pride. It's got a lot of pride. It doesn't like it when people do bad things to us. We, we almost immediately want to see them destroyed. Hey, but that's not how we should be, you know, unless they're an enemy of God, a reprobate, that's a different story. Hey, but just your average person, that might make your life a little difficult. You don't get along very, with, with very well. Hey, you know, we should love our enemies. We should do good to those okay, that, uh, that do evil toward us. And, and one way to be able to overcome that, that, that vengeance that you may desire toward an enemy is just to humble yourself by fasting, okay? It actually has an effect on that pride, on that fleshly part of you that uh, is very selfish, okay? Now, if you go to Psalm 69, verse 10, Psalm 69, verse 10, so we're just looking at three Psalms here. Psalm 69 and verse number 10, what else, what other effect does fasting have on us? Psalm 69 verse 10, it says, When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. Okay, so listen, the psalmist here says, look, I'm going to chasten myself. You know, normally when we do wrong, we, we understand that the Lord God will chasten us, He'll correct us. Hey, but the psalmist here knows, look, I've done wrong, I've committed sin, I need to chasten myself. Okay? There are certain things that I'm doing in my flesh. You know, there are certain sins that I'm struggling with. You know, I don't have victory over these sins and I need to be chastised. I need to be uh, reproached. What does reproach mean? He needs to rebuke himself, he's saying, right? I need to rebuke myself and the way I'm going to do this is by fasting. Okay? You go, wow, what's he doing? Well, he's, he's not allowing his body to go with food, right? His flesh wants to uh, be nourished. His flesh wants to eat, you know, wants to eat some junk food or some food that he wants to indulge in. He says, no, there's a sin. Uh, I, I need to rebuke myself. My flesh is too strong here. I need to weaken that flesh. I need to uh, rebuke that flesh, and therefore I'm going to fast, okay? I'm not going to give this flesh what it wants. And so what is he trying to do? He's trying to strengthen the spirit, the inner man that's with, you know, within, you know, and weakening that fleshly, that sinful nature that he has on the outside, okay? He's rebuking himself. Probably a good idea 
You know, and we'll, we'll look at this later. Probably a good idea, if you know the chastisement of the Lord is coming, maybe chastise yourself first, okay? <laughs> Before the heavy hand of the Lord falls upon you. Please go to Psalm 109 now. Psalm 109 and verse 24. Now, if you ever have fasted, especially for a, a long period of time, you know, you, you may uh, realize, you know, you may have headaches because your, your, your body's like telling you, hey, you got to eat, right? Or you might find yourself uh, being a little bit weak. Maybe, you know, uh, you, you'll find yourself struggling a little bit. And the psalmist says here in Psalm 109 verse 24, it says, my knees are weak through fasting. And then it says, and my flesh falleth of fatness. Right? So, so look, I, I'm fasting and it makes my, my knees weak, right? It makes my flesh weak. It makes my flesh, uh, w- you know, not have the fatness that it normally would have, okay? Because if you spend, you know, especially several days fasting, that's one quick way to lose weight, okay? That's definitely one quick way. And so he's showing, it, just showing, this psalm is just showing us the effect that it has on the flesh, okay? The effects. And don't forget, don't forget, it's this flesh, it's this old man that sins, that has a desire to sin, Okay? And so, f- what does fasting do? You're stopping that flesh from having everything it wants, wow. all right? Stopping it from having food will have an effect and, and, and help you overcome other things that the flesh desires, other sins. You know, the f- you know eating is not a sin, right? But you're preventing that flesh from, from uh, being fulfilled, you know, from, from being strengthened. And it's going to cause you to not be able to sin in the same way. It's going to strengthen the spirit, strengthen the inner man, all right? So, that's, the, that's really the purpose of of fasting, okay? It's about making the flesh weaker and, and making the spirit stronger. Please go to Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. Go to Philippians chapter 3, verse number 4. And while you're turning to Philippians 3, 4, I'm going to read to you from Galatians 5, 16. You go to uh, Philippians 3. I'm going to read to you from Galatians 5, 16, which says, This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust." of the flesh, okay? So what does fasting do? It causes us not to fulfill the lust of the flesh because, you know, eating, is, in many ways, you're kind of lusting after that, right? Even though it's not sinful in of itself, you know, just that, that feeling of nourishment, putting something in your mouth, filling your belly, is, is a lust of hunger in a sense, right? And so you're not giving that what the body wants and you're asking, you know, I want to walk in the Spirit instead. Instead of fulfilling the lust of the flesh, I'm going to walk in the Spirit. Then it says in verse number 17, For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would, okay? So what's one advantage of fasting? Weakening that flesh, that you can do the things that you would, all right? You can strengthen the Spirit. You can walk in the Spirit by not giving the flesh what it desires. Now, you're in Philippians chapter 3. Look at verse number 4. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 4. It says here, Paul speaking, though I, I might have, sorry, that I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh that he have whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Okay? Now he's saying, look, if, if you get the context of this passage, you know, it's saying that we shouldn't have confidence in our flesh, in our good works, in who we are. You know, we're nothing if we're without Jesus Christ. And so our confidence ought to come from Christ. Look at verse number five. It says, Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. And then he goes on. He goes on about all the things he could potentially have confidence in, the confidence of the flesh. And so what we're trying to do when we fast is not to have confidence in the flesh, but to find confidence in the Spirit, to find confidence in Jesus Christ. Okay? So fasting helps us to walk that spiritual life, okay? To walk in the Spirit. And so that's why it's important just from time to time, whatever your need is, just just remember, look, you know, I haven't fasted for a while. It's probably time for me to do that. Hey, maybe I've not seen souls being saved at the doors. I've been going out there. Maybe I need to fast for the Lord to open those opportunities for me. You know, maybe it's some sickness, some, some sickness that is just a constant, you know, for you. Maybe it's time for you to fast about these things. And so, you know, obviously the main reason for fasting, and I don't want to go through this as my main point, but the main reason is so we can have our prayers answered. So the Lord can see our dedication to walk in the Spirit and not after the flesh, okay? And for Him to step in and see that desire we have and turn His heart, the Lord's heart, to do something that maybe otherwise He wouldn't have done if not for the fasting, okay? Now, what I want to turn to, please, go to Exodus 34. Exodus 34. Because we're going to look at the first mention 
or at least the first mention that I could find. I tried really hard to find anything earlier. This is the first mention that I see of fasting in the Bible. Exodus 34, please. Exodus 34. Because one mistake that I made early in my Christian life when I started to fast, and maybe some of you make the same mistake, it's easy to make. Is all right, I'm going to fast today, right? And you think it's just about not eating, okay? And maybe you say a prayer here and there, you know, because you've got to pray and fast, all right? But then you kind of go about the rest of your life as per usual. I don't know if you're like that. But one thing you must notice that when the first time we see a fast here, Exodus 34, verse 28, it's when Moses receives the Ten Commandments from the Lord, okay? And it says here, and he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. Hey, this was a dry fast completely. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, okay? So man, you know, uh, Moses is about to receive, you know, a very special revelation from God, right? This covenant that the, the, the nation of Israel will be part of with God. And the Lord, you know, was, what did it say there? And he was there with the Lord, okay? So when he's fasting these 40 days, don't forget the point, he's there with the Lord. So if you're spending a day of fasting, guess what? Spend that day with the Lord. Don't forget the Lord. That's why you're fasting. You want to have some closeness with the Lord, all right? Now, I don't know if it's possible to fast for 40 days and 40 nights without water and food. You can definitely fast 40 days without food, okay? You can, you can probably, I think you can go like at least one or two months without food and still live, all right? Uh, but, you know, you, I don't know, is it, is it like a, a week or two weeks? You, you, can, you can't go without water, otherwise you just die, okay? Something like that. I don't, I don't know exactly what it is, all right? So what we get out of this, obviously, brethren, it, he, and he did go without water, and so, obviously, the Lord was sustaining Moses, okay? Moses was so close to the Lord, something that I don't think is physically possible to go 40 days without food and water, somehow the Lord was supernaturally sustaining Moses, okay? And how, can he, how was the Lord able to do that? Because Moses was with the Lord, right? Was with the Lord. And so, there was some type of special sustenance. And why do I bring this to your attention? Because don't forget, fasting is about weakening that flesh, Okay? Now, you might find it, I'll just share with you, okay? Uh, I'm a bit embarrassed sharing this stuff with you, but anyway. You know, in my early days as a Christian, or, you know, when I took the, the, you know, the Bible seriously, I thought, oh, I better fast. I'm like, all right, I'm going without food. I've got to pray, and I pray, you know, I pray a few times during the day about certain things. And then it's like, oh, man, I'm without food. And your body starts to crave food, right? And then you go to the kitchen, you're like, oh, I, no, I'm, I'm fasting. I'm fasting. I go to, uh, and and you're, like, your, your mind's you know, trying to feed itself, right? You're trying to get that food because it's not normal for you to fast, right? And it's like, well, I've got to distract myself with food. What am I going to do? Well, let's turn on the TV. Let's watch some, some Hollywood movie. Let's watch some TV show. Oh, video game. I'll play a video game. That'll get me distracted. You know, putting the FIFA 20 or something, right? Play the video games. Oh, yeah, that's keeping my mind off food. Yes, I'm fasting. That's not right. I'm still giving into the flesh. Right? <laughs> so, you know, when we fast, brethren, we're, we're, we're stopping the flesh from having what it wants. Not just food, okay? But anything your flesh naturally desires, you know, anything that is, you know, ungodly, that's not going to be, uh, you know, keep you close to the Lord, just don't do that stuff. That's not, you're not really praying and fasting. You're not spending time with the Lord. And so this is the hardest part, you know, going, let's say, 24 hours. You know, of, of uh, just reading your Bible. Hey, that's good. Read your Bible, right? Hey, pray to the Lord. You know, think about Him. Hey, sing praises to the Lord. And look, if you've got work, hey, that's a good way to get distracted anyway. You've got work, you've got stuff to do. Praise God. But hey, while you're working, hey, you know, stop every while, you know, once in a while. Pray to the Lord. Ask Him to keep you, you know, blessing you throughout the day. And, f and just ask Him to help you, ment you know, for your mental thing, uh, you know, not to, not to, not to uh, get distracted by the things of this world and, and things like that. But listen, when it comes to, obviously, fasting, if, if you please go to 1 Corinthians, go to 1 Corinthians. It's about denying the flesh. Don't give the flesh what it wants. Okay? Or you're not really fasting. <laughs> you know, watching movies all day to keep you distracted is not really spending time with the Lord. Well, it's not spending time with the Lord at all. Okay? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 5. I just want to show you this from the New Testament as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 5. 
This is speaking about the, uh, you know, marital relationship between husband and wife, right? It says in 1 Corinthians 7, 5, it says, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Okay? So what is it saying here? If you're going to spend a, a day of prayer and fasting, then also abstain from that marital relationship for that day, for that period of time. Okay? Because what, what are you doing again? You're not giving the flesh what it wants. You know, you're preventing that flesh. You're being strengthened in the spirit, right? You're not giving that flesh anything it desires. Okay? You want to be able to spend time with the Lord in prayer and fasting. And so what I want to do with you now, brethren, is to go through six reasons or six times that we see in the Bible that we see people fast and how we can apply that for us today. So if you can please turn to Judges chapter 20. Go to Judges chapter 20 for me. And this is quite an interesting story. I won't give you the whole context, but uh, uh, the tribe of Benjamin was ex extremely wicked during these days, right? And uh, the, the, the rest of the tribes of Israel basically went to make war against the tribe of Benjamin, but the tribe of Benjamin had very skillful, very powerful warriors, right? Hey, but they needed to be taught a lesson. They were very wicked, right? And in fact, the Lord did want the rest of Israel to, uh, to attack uh, the tribe, okay? They needed to be corrected. They needed to be brought down. And so the, the story basically where we're going to pick up, in Judges chapter 20, verse 26, is that the, 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 you know, the, the children of Israel did go make war against the tribe of Benjamin, which was right, but then they lost. They lost the battle, okay? So then they went to the house of the Lord. They went to the tabernacle, and they said, God, is it really something you want us to do? Do you want us to fight against the Benjamites? And the Lord said, yes, that's something I want you to do. So they go and fight again a second time, and they lose again, all right? And so they come back to the house of the Lord, and we're going to read now the third time, and they ask the Lord again, you know, do you really want us to go and fight, Lord? We've lost now twice, okay? Look at verse number 26. Then all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came unto the house of God and wept and sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until even. So now they're actually fasting. Okay, they didn't fast the other times, but this time they are fasting before the Lord until even. So that's until the evening, you know. Um, and then it says, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And the children of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the ark of the covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into thine hand. Okay? And without reading the rest of it, if you want to read it yourself, you can. But they do, they, they go a third time to fight against the tribe of Benjamin. And they start to kind of lose a little bit at the beginning. But overall, they finally have victory, you know, the third time. They finally have victory. And, you know, th there's a couple of lessons here that we can learn, okay? Number one, they only had victory when they fasted. Okay, they didn't fast the other two times, okay? But number two, this kind of gives us a lesson as to when we should fast. Listen, when you know God wants something, he, he, you, know he, you, you know the Lord wants you to achieve something, do something, there's a work to be done, there's a battle to fight, and you know the Lord wants you involved, but somehow you're not getting victory, yeah, you might have to lose one time. You may have to lose a second time, okay? But when that happens, you say, well, Lord, you know what? It's time to fast, it's time to really, you know, dig in deep and say, Lord, why is it that we're not having victory? Are you sure you want me to fight this battle? Hey, maybe the third time we fast in, the Lord may very well answer that for you. And so point number one is fast when you need victory in battle. Fast when you need victory in battle, especially it's a battle that God's telling you to fight, okay? And so, you know, th this can be our sins. This can be the things that we struggle with, right? There might be a sin that is just holding you hostage, day after day after day, and you don't have victory. And it seems like, you know, you try to fight the battle, and you have some success, and then you lose. You know, you've done it again, and you go and again, you do it again, you fight the battle, yeah, I'm fighting, and you lose. You know what you do? You, be, you better stop and say, well, why am I losing this battle? I know God wants me to win this thing. Maybe it's time to fast. Maybe I've got to win this battle by fasting, okay? So that's a good time to fast when you realize that it's a fight that God wants you to win, but you're just not winning it for some reason, okay? I'm going to read to you from Matthew 17, verse 18, 
It says, And Jesus rebuked the devil and departed, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not, sorry, goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Okay? So the Lord did give his disciples power over the devils. They were able to cast out devils, right? But there was some devil, I guess more powerful than the average, you know, uh, affecting this child. And the disciples were unable to take that devil out. Jesus tells them why. You had unbelief. You were lacking in faith. That's why. But in fact, actually, even if, even if you did have the faith, this kind only goes out by prayer and fasting. And don't forget, the disciples of Jesus at this point in time were not fasting because the bridegroom was with them. Now, Jesus was able to cast out that devil, of course, you know, being the Lord God, you know. But what we learn here, brethren, again, this is a fight. This is a, you know, we're not necessarily going to fight a battle. We're not going to take on swords and, and go and, and attack some tribe. In a, well, now we're broken up in tribes, aren't we? You know, maybe one day, hey, the New South Wales tribe will come and fight against Queensland. Why don't you let us cross the borders? I might be fighting that one, trying to get up here on a Wednesday. I don't know. Hey, but we, okay, we may not fight that kind of battle, but we are fighting spiritual battles. You know, there are forces of darkness at work. There might be devils that are preventing us from having some type of victory. And if we're struggling, then we need to think about praying and fasting. You know, get rid of that kind of devil, that kind of evil spirit, so we can accomplish great things for God, okay? So number one was fast when you need victory in battle. If you can now please turn to uh, 2 Samuel, please. Go to 2 Samuel. Yeah, go to 2 Samuel chapter 1. 2 Samuel chapter 1. Uh, Nicholas, can you give me a bit more water? <clears throat> Second Samuel chapter 1, verse number 11. And this is one that I don't really do, but I, I, I couldn't help but see it in the Bible many times. So I thought I'd better raise this as a point, because even though this is something I personally do, it might still be a help to one of you. But point number two, well, let's read it first. Second Samuel chapter 1, verse 11. This is after... Uh, King Saul and his children uh, are killed, okay? They, they die the death, and of course, you know, uh, Saul was trying to... Did I say Saul or Samuel? Uh, I meant to say Saul if I said Samuel, okay? King Saul uh, died, and, and of course, David loved Saul, even though Saul was an enemy toward David. It says in verse number 11, Then David took hold of his clothes and rent them, and likewise all the men that were with him, and they mourned and wept and fasted until even... For Saul and for Jonathan his son, and for the people of the Lord, and for the house of Israel, because they were fallen by the sword. So we see here the people of Israel fasting. And, and one thing that I noticed as I was just going through the Bible, was looking at different references, how many times they fast when someone passes away. Okay? And so point number two is fast to mourn the passing of a loved one. Fast to mourn the passing of a loved one. Now, this is the one that I personally don't really... Well, here's the thing. I, I haven't had too many times where a loved one has passed away in my life, so maybe that's one reason I've not really thought about this. But why do we mourn? Why do people mourn when someone passes away? You know, why is it that we don't just go up to someone and just get over it? No, people need to mourn. You know, if, if someone in their family has, has died, has passed on, because mourning is a natural part of your life where you know you can grieve you can think about that life that that is lost that's gone and uh and then once you've mourned you feel a lot better okay you know you've, you've given your due time to think about that individual and now you can go on with life you know you can go on and and, and continue uh living your life building your life because one thing i think what happens when, when when someone loses a loved one and they don't mourn properly that this can be like they, it's something they they, they struggle with for the rest of their life. It's, it's something they can't really get over. It's always in the back of the mind, you're like, why did I lose so-and-so? You know, sometimes when I go door to door soul winning, and I'm sure some of you have experienced this, some people are, resist the gospel. They don't want to talk about heaven and hell because some loved one has passed away. You know, that loved one could have passed away a long time ago. And even that, they just, they haven't mourned properly. They haven't really, you know, considered eternity you know, they haven't considered that their life is short and they're just angry, they're just bitter to, toward losing this person when they should have mourned properly 
and then they would have been able to move on with their life. You know, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 4, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. All right? For they shall be comforted. You know, I, I'm the kind of person where I, I, I don't know why, but I've got like a delayed mourn, mourning. All right? When someone passes away and I see everybody quite upset, I'm not usually upset. I, I don't know why. I just, it's, just, it's just my makeup. I'm not really upset immediately. I'm like, okay, he passed away. I don't know why it takes a while for it to process in my mind. And then like two weeks down the track, then I mourn. I don't know why. I can't really tell you why that is. Okay, but I've got this delayed mourning that always happens for some reason when people can mourn immediately. But one thing I realized th- uh, here, why is fasting important? Why is it necessary? Because I think for someone like me who has this delayed mourning, where maybe you don't end up mourning when you should, okay, what does fasting do once again? It, it, it weakens that flesh, right? It, it, it helps you not to be selfish, self-centered. And I think what mourning does is, you know, take, uh, sorry, fasting while you're mourning is takes the attention away from yourself and, and, and what you're doing today and be able to consider others, right? You're not fulfilling the lust of the flesh, You know, you're not trying to be self-centered at this point in time, but you're thinking about the fact that that life has been lost. You know, hopefully it's a a believer, and you can think about, well, I'm going to see this person for all eternity in heaven. Hey, if it's an unbeliever that's gone to hell, you say, well, that's, that's that's sad. It's a loss that this person's in hell, but I know what they want more than anything now that they're in hell. They want to see other people come to Jesus Christ, and, you know, that's what I'll be doing on there for them. The fact that they're in hell is to be able to get out there and try to get other people saved. And so just mourning about it, thinking about others, thinking about families that, that, that might be upset, you know, that that loved one has passed away so you can kind of relate a little better with that person. And so I believe that's the reason why we see in the Bible that people fasted as well as mourned is because it helped them reflect on others that might be suffering for that loss of life, okay? Please go to First Samuel now, First Samuel chapter 7. 1 Samuel chapter 7. What's another reason? When should we fast? What's another reason that we should fast? 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse number 3. 1 Samuel chapter 7, and verse number 3. The Bible reads, And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Asherah from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve Him only, and He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So, the, so you know, here we have Israel, right? Philist, the Philistines being one of the chief enemies that we read about in the Bible. So, you know, they're, 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 you know, they're at war with the Philistines. But not only that, they've turned their hearts to other gods, to Asheroth there, that's mentioned. And Samuel's telling the children of Israel, hey, you know, get your things together. Turn back to God. You know, you can turn back to God. He's going to help you in your, in your battle. Look at verse number four. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Asheroth and serve the Lord only. And Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mizpeh and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together unto Mizpeh and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day. And said there, we have sinned against the Lord, and Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpeh. And if you keep reading the context later on, you'll notice that God gives them a great victory against the Philistines. Okay, so what's point number three? Fast if you find yourself far from God. You're not in a backslidden state. You're far from God, right? You're no longer serving Him. You're not worshipping Him. Maybe, hey look, there might be some false gods that you're, you're following after. There might be some, some weakness, some sin that you're, that, you're, that you're desiring that's keeping you away from God. And now you're, in, now you're having problems. Now there are the Philistines around you. Now you're struggling because God's not delivering you anymore. Well, you know what you do? Get right with God. Go back to God. Get back in fellowship with Him. Go and pray and spend time in fast, fasting. Okay? Sp- spend time fasting. Fast if you find yourself far from God. Once again, you're weakening that flesh. You're not giving the lust that that flesh desires. And you're turning your, your mind upon the spiritual man, the inner man that does love the Lord. Okay? And that inner man, which the Lord, of course, uh, has died for. Okay? And so, you know, it, it, you know it, it, fasting can bring you back into fellowship with God if you've been far away from the Lord from, for some time. Okay? Please go to 2 Samuel now. Go back to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel, so you can see a few references here from Samuel, trying to keep it all within the same books. 
2 Samuel chapter 12, please. 2 Samuel chapter 12. Point number four is fast when someone is gravely sick. Fast when someone is gravely sick. So again, you know, this all has to do with, you know, getting the Lord to answer those prayers for us. Verse number 15. 2 Samuel 12, 15. And uh, of course, uh, this is the story of uh, David and Bathsheba, where they committed adultery and that David basically murders her husband, you know. And so the prophet Nathan comes to, and you know, Bath, uh, Bathsheba finds herself pregnant. And then you've got the prophet Nathan, Nathan comes up to David and, and rebukes him, you know, exposes him for what he's done. And in verse number 15, it says, And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick, okay? So if you've got, you know, a family member, a child that's very, very sick, you know what you should be doing? You should be praying, and not just praying, but fasting, that the Lord would heal that child. Look at verse number 16. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not. Neither did he eat bread with them. As you can see, David fasting here. Verse number 18. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. Okay, so David fasts for a whole week. You know, you can see a whole week fasting here. But even though he fasted, the child still died. Okay, still died here. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake to him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him the child is dead? And when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. And so the servants were worried. Right? They, they saw David for a whole week, not eating. He was bowed down to the ground. He was praying to the Lord, hoping that the Lord would turn his judgment and not allow this child to die because of his sin. Right? He goes a whole week like this. His servants are worried. And then when the child dies, they're like, Man, we can't even tell David. What's he going to do? Right? What's gonna, he's been fasting this whole time. Like, uh, he, might, well, he might commit suicide. Who knows what he can do, right? He's so upset. And so David asked the question, like, what, is the child dead? And they said, yes. Verse number 20. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. And he came to his own house and when he required, they set bread before him and he did eat. So after the child died, you see he's back to eating, right? He's given up the fast. Verse number 21, Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done, that thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, and when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread? And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Okay, just one thought there. You know, if you've ever lost a child, you know, whether a child that's been born or a child in the womb, you know, you've got the promise that you will go to that child. You know, one day you will see that child in heaven. Okay, praise God for that, for anyone that has lost a child. But notice the reason David fasted and prayed was he, you know, in verse number 22, 22 he said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to, toward me, uh, gracious to me, that the child may live? Okay. So David recognized if 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 my child is sick, you know, to the point of death, I'm going to pray, I'm going to weep, I'm going to fast, I'm going to see if the Lord will do something. I'm going to see if the Lord can be gracious. And in this case, it didn't happen. But who's to say it's not going to happen with you, brethren? You know what? If he didn't pray and fast, that child would definitely have died. You don't know how you can turn the heart of God by your fast. Now, the sin of David was so wicked, you know, was so bad, was so wicked, okay? So this child obviously ended up losing his life. You know, David had to be judged. He had to be punished for what he had done. But who's not to say that someone that you love who might be potentially close to death or dying, you know, it might be your prayers, your weeping, your fasting before God that causes the Lord to heal that individual on your behalf, okay? So point number four is fast when someone is gravely sick. Now, let's go to the book of Jonah, Jonah, because what we saw there, of course, was David who fasted, and, but it didn't work out for him this time, okay? 
But that doesn't mean it doesn't work, okay? We see that fasting definitely works, and of course it worked in the, uh, with the prophet Jonah here, Jonah chapter 3, verse 4. And of course, this is a very famous story, Jonah chapter 3, verse number 4. Point number 5 is fast to appease God's anger. Fast to appease God's anger. Jonah chapter 3, verse number 4. Of course, Jonah's been chosen by God as a prophet to Nineveh, a Gentile city, very wicked city. You know, God, it was so wicked, you know, that God's just seeking to destroy it. He's just sending a warning to the people. Hey, it's going to happen. God's going to step in. Your wickedness is too great. God's going to destroy this city. All right? Verse number 4, Jonah chapter 3, verse number 4. And Jonah began to enter into a city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So there's forty days. God's going to do it. Okay? And look at verse number 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. Okay? And then it says, if you drop down to verse number 9, drop down to verse number 9, it says, Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from His fierce anger that we per perish not? So they're saying, you know, these, 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 uh, these Gentiles are saying the same thing that King David said. You know, who would tell? Maybe God will stop this if we fast, right? If we turn and we, we repent, we turn God away from His fierce anger. Look at verse number 10. And God saw their works. They had turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that He had said He would do unto them, and He did it not. Wow. Does fasting work? Does praying and fasting work? Yeah. Repenting from your sins too, right? When God is about to judge and destroy you, He's got fierce wrath. Hey, you know what? While you've got 40 days, pray and fast about it. God may very well change His mind. You know, your fasting might appease God's anger. He says, wow, they've learned the lesson. You know, God was definitely going to destroy them. That was the prophecy, right? But we see that, you know, God is long-suffering. He's merciful, all right? And even this wicked city, they were able to say, you know what? We believe God. What a place to be. We believe God. Praise God. That's a great place to start. We believe God. And that caused them to believe the preaching of Jonah. I mean, Jonah didn't like this. I don't, I don't, I don't know why, you know? Like, as a preacher... You know, I, I would like what I say and what I, what I, you know, what, what I preach, I, I would like it to be effective. Like, I would like it for you to get closer to God. <laughs> but these, these people, you know, they, they did get closer to God, and Jonah didn't like it. He wanted God to just utterly destroy that city. You know, it must have been a, a very extremely wicked city. So point number five, brethren, was fast to appease God's anger. Now, if you can please turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 13. All right. So, obviously, you know, next week when we pray for things, I want you to be thinking about what you'd like us to be praying for. Um, we may, we may uh, do the prayer via live stream, but if we do, it won't be a public link. It'll just be a private link that we share to family members of the church that might be listening online, so it's not something that anybody can listen to. I might, I might do that, all right? But I want you to be thinking over the week, what is it that you really need answers to prayer for? Now, it might be things that we've been praying about every week, it might be something else that's on your heart that, you know, maybe you haven't been going to the Lord about and you really need this church to be praying for it. Please think about it because if this church is praying and fasting, the Lord will hear. Who can tell if God will do it for us, right? He might step in and answer that prayer. You're in Acts chapter 13, verse number 1. And so obviously all these reasons I'm giving you are not necessarily things we're going to be praying about. Well, it could be some of these things. I'm just trying to give you other reasons maybe that you've not considered that you might need to be praying and fasting about, that you've not really thought about. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing it in your own time as well, you know. But listen, next week, next Wednesday, please be thinking about this. I, I really would like as many people to be involved as possible. Acts chapter 13, verse number 1 reads, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called uh, Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, and they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them, they, and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So point number six is fast when ordaining men into church service. All right? Fast when ordaining men into church 
service, okay? I'm not going to elaborate on this point all that much, right? Please go to the next chapter, Acts chapter 14, Acts chapter 14. And so, you know, if we ever get to a point, and my desire is that, you know, I, I hope, not necessarily within the 12 months that I'm down there in Sydney, but hopefully shortly after, my, my desire is that I can ordain a man, you know, into an office, you know, whether that's an, the office of a pastor, I hope, all right, but most likely the office of a deacon or something along those lines, right? So before doing that, you know, this is something we ought to be praying and fasting for, and I'd be asking this church to be doing that, you know, as well as a church down there in Sydney, because it is an important task when you, when you appoint a man to full-time ministry in the house of God, you know, or to start churches or to be pastoring or, or taking one of these positions, it's important that we fast and ask the Lord to guide us in that. Look at Acts 14, verse number 21. Just to show you that this is not a one-time thing, Acts 14, 21, and when they had preached the gospel to that city <coughs> and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So we just see again, you know, just, just to show you a second passage there where when they went to ordain elders or pastors into every church, they spent time in prayer and fasting, okay? So point number six, brethren, fast when ordaining men into church service. Seems like a very important thing for the Lord to record that twice for us uh, to pay attention to, okay? Now, please go to Matthew chapter six. We're going to end on this one. I'm almost done now. Matthew chapter six. Let me go through those six points one, once again. Point number one was fast when you need victory in battle. Point number two was fast to mourn the passing of a loved one. Number three was fast if you find yourself far from God. Number four, fast when someone is gravely sick. Point number five was fast to appease God's anger. Point number six is fast when ordaining men into church service. Okay, so in conclusion, Matthew chapter six, okay, uh, because one thing that we should do when we fast is not whine about it. <laughs> Don't complain about it. Don't go around, you know, people and just like, oh man, I'm, I'm, I've been fasting all day, brother. You know, I'm really struggling, but I've been fasting, right? Now, that might be a desire of the flesh to, to boast of itself or something like that, right? But look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. When we do fast, if you do contribute to the fasting next week, next Wednesday, I want you to keep this in mind, okay? Moreover, verse number 16, Matthew 6, 16, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad, sad countenance, for they dis disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. So listen, if you're going to fast on Wednesday, don't have a sad countenance. You know, if you do, if you're like, oh man, such a bad fast, it's so hard. I'm just going to, you're a hypocrite. <laughs> you're one of those that Jesus was speaking about. <laughs> okay? Don't do it. Okay, don't disfigure your face. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Man, you know what? If I'm going to fast, I like to eat. If I'm going to fast and go without, and I'm going to be hungry, I want to make sure my prayer gets answered, right? I want to make sure my prayer goes to the Lord, you know? Last thing I want to do is show, oh man, I'm, I've been fasting for three days, brethren, you know? And that's my reward. You going, well done, patting me on the back. That's, that's the answer that I'm going to, that's all I'm going to get. Well done. I'm not going to get the answer to prayer that I'll, you know, what's the point of doing all that work and not getting it going to the Lord, right? So we have to be careful. Look at verse number 17. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Okay? So we want our father in heaven to be the one that sees us fasting, okay? So when you come next week on Wednesday, if you're fasting, brethren, have a shower, anoint your head, put a bit of, no, you don't have to put oil, a bit, bit of gel, a bit of hairspray, wash your face, okay? Yeah, I mean, you better, you gotta, you know how, you, you gotta look better than ever. Like, you gotta look like someone that's walked in. It's like, that guy's not fasting. Look, look how well he's doing, man, it looks so good. That's that ought to be you, right? Don't have your face disfigured, don't be of a sad countenance, don't be looking for the praise of men. Because we want our fast, we want our prayers, our needs to be heard by God. We want the Father to reward us, not man to reward us for fasting. 
We want to make sure the Lord is the one that answers our prayers and rewards us. I believe in fasting. I've seen fasting work. I've seen it work. I never forget, just, just because I don't want to obviously boast about all the occasions, but I never forget going, we, as a church, going two months, something along the lines. We're going so win every week, not seeing a single salvation. And we decided to fast. And then it's like that same week, there was like two or three salvations. And it was like week after week after week, salvation after salvation after salvation. That's not a coincidence, brethren. That's not a coincidence. Okay? That's us humbling ourselves, going before the Lord, says, Lord, I don't know. I know you want us to have victory in soul winning. You want us, you know, I know you want to see souls saved on the Sunshine Coast, but it's not happening right now, Lord. And so we fasted. And the Lord rewarded us openly, you know. So don't tell me fasting doesn't work. It works, okay. I can't tell you exactly how it works. All I know is it humbles us, you know. It, it doesn't give the flesh what it wants and helps us to be in the Spirit, like to be to to be to know and, and walk in the will and the Spirit of God. Okay, let's pray.